assessment. So that's Tina Kay, who works at Lancaster University, next to um, Judith, who, who works beside her. She is a professor in second language acquisition, and she's published widely on the effects of dyslexia in learning additional languages. She's also worked, like Tina Kay, in assessment research, and she's advised numerous language testing organisations on their access arrangement policies. So uh, we have two experts here to talk about assessment, and it's a specific type of assessment that we're going to see today. And I think this might be quite new for many teachers here. So if you have questions uh, about what Tina Kay and Judith are going to present, put them in the comments section, put them in the chat, and we'll be back to answer them later. Well, that's enough for me. We're gonna hand over now to our presenters. So when you're ready, feel free to share the screen and I'll, I'll be here if you need me. Okay. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, and welcome on my behalf as well, everyone. I am Tineke Branfo, and so as uh, Melissa introduced, together with my colleague, Judith Kormos, we will be talking about uh, multimodal assessment tasks. Um, and our plan for today is as follows. Uh, so in this uh, about 40 minute webinar, uh, we will first, or I will first say something briefly about multimodal language use. And then uh, I will make this much more concrete for you by showing you some examples of multimodal tasks. And then I will hand over to Judith, who will share some tips for uh, how you can create your own multimodal So I give you some insights in how you can then, once the learners have completed the tasks, uh, how you can then rate or mark uh, their performances on the tasks. Okay, so um, I'll just get cracking uh, and uh, so start with a little bit of background on the multimodal nature of language use. Um, so human communication actually is often a combination of various channels, an oral channel, uh, a written channel, uh, a gestural channel, a spatial channel, a visual channel. In fact, uh, what you are doing right now is very multimodal. You can see me speak, you can hear me speak, you see my gestures, uh, you see a PowerPoint with visual information, which you can read, which is organized in a particular manner. Uh, so human communication is in uh, many instances, essentially multimodal. Uh, human language use also often involves a combination of language skills, uh, reading and speaking uh, together or listening and speaking or reading and writing. So human language use is often also integrated. And with the fast and also very vast increases in the spread of technology, its accessibility, the functions that are available now, we are seeing uh, changes in the ways in which we communicate, but also even more fundamentally in uh, the nature of uh, communication. And at this point in time, it is fair to say that uh, multimodal integrated forms of language use actually prevail a lot in our communication. And um, forms of what we could call multimodal literacy are now required to effectively communicate in many social, educational and professional contexts. And so this um, makes clear the importance of multimodality in communication. Uh, what is the situation at present in uh, the area of language education? Well, we know from recent research that there is actually still quite a disconnection between what is happening in language teaching and in assessment. So we've seen in recent years a, a decent uptake of multimodal pedagogies and curricula. Uh, but when we look at the assessments that are used in those same contexts, very often they are still very much product oriented narrowly focused on language as such and not sort of the other modes in our communication. Uh, 
in those contexts where there are multimodal assessments, there we see that there's still a bit of a disconnect between the use of multimodal tasks. So this happens a lot, uh, adopting multimodal tasks. But then when we look at how the learner's performances on those tasks are evaluated, we see that the rating criteria that are used are very much traditional linguistic performance criteria, such as um, sort of vocabulary and grammar, maybe written organization in a written text. And so the focus is very much on those individual productive skills in the rating and not the bigger multimodality. There is some exciting work going on uh, on multimodal assessments uh, in higher education in particular, uh, in English for academic or specific purposes programs. Uh, but what we see is the work happening there is very much um, of a formative nature, uh, project types of assessment, continuous assessments and involving pair and group work. Of course, there are other examples as well, but these are sort of the main trends we are seeing. Um, and so we wondered about the use of multimodal assessments in more summative testing contexts uh, where um, the aim is to evaluate general uh, rather than specific purposes language proficiency in a second language. Uh, and so this is where our work uh, is situated and we wanted to explore the possibilities of such summative uh, general second language proficiency assessments um, that focus on multimodality. Um, now, I wonder, uh, though, whether you have actually ever used multimodal tasks for assessing your learner's language proficiency. Um, so could you perhaps tell us in the chat, uh, just simply type yes or no, uh, whether you've ever used multimodal tasks for assessment purposes? So I see yeses, not really, yes with the aid of other tools. Some say yes in, in specific purposes contexts. Some people say not sure, great. And, and maybe that's also because you don't have a clear idea yet of what a multimodal task is like. So that's great. We're seeing a great mix of, of people um, uses of these kinds of tasks. Okay, so I'll go back into the slideshow and um, make this uh, more concrete. So, oh, for some reason my slides don't want to move forward. Okay, um, so I'll show you some examples of some multimodal tasks. Um, so the types of tasks that Judith and I have been experimenting with and have developed is what we've called viewing to write tasks. Uh, and so in these kinds of tasks, as a, a learner, as a test taker, you watch an input that is both oral and visual. So essentially a video where you're listening to speakers, but you're also watching things on a screen uh, and a variety of things you're watching uh, at. And uh, while you are doing that viewing or that watching, uh, you are allowed to take notes. Uh, and then after that, uh, you need to write a, a short piece of text uh, that is based on that uh, video input. Um, now we have been uh, experimenting with two types of viewing to write tasks. And the first type is what we have labeled viewing to compare and contrast tasks. Now, what is this all about? So in these kinds of tasks, as a test taker, first you watch a video cast in which you can see two experts discussing a specific topic. And whilst you see the experts talking, um, there are also visuals uh, on the screen. So pictures, graphs, written words, and so on. Now, I also want to clarify that the context in which we were working was one of adolescents and younger adults, so upper secondary school types of level. And our uh, learners were um, 
quite high intermediate, uh, some even advanced. Um, so generally, a lot of them were at the B2 level of the, of the Common European Framework of Reference. Some were at the C level, some were at the B1 lower intermediate level, but just to give you an idea of the particular context in which we were working. And so our video inputs were actually quite lengthy, four minutes and a half. And so we allowed them to play the video twice because obviously it's quite a lot of information and to take notes uh, whilst they were watching. And so then the second step was that we asked them to write a short report in which they had to compare and contrast the views of those two experts, their opinions on that particular topic. And so we presented this on a computer. Uh, and in our case, our students, our learners had uh, their own laptops, but you could also just present this on a computer screen uh, for the whole classroom at, a, uh, in, at once. Um, so uh, first of all, we gave them the instructions and these were presented on the screen, but there was also a, an audio associated with it so they could also listen. Um, so I'll read out uh, the instructions. So um, the, they went as follows. Uh, you will watch a video in which two people discuss their views on a certain topic. The video will be played twice. You are allowed to take notes while watching. Then write a short report comparing and contrasting the two speakers' views. Summarize the key points discussed, indicating clearly any similarities and differences between the two speakers' views. Always make clear whose views you are reporting. Your text should be coherent and 200 to 250 words in length, and a title will be provided for you. And then the video will start now. So in these initial instructions, we said something about the video input uh, and how that would happen. But we also gave them a heads up already in terms of what kind of writing would be expected. So we gave them a purpose, a direction for the watching the video. OK. And so then they uh, could watch the video. Now for uh, time restrictions uh, here, uh, uh, we won't be um, sharing the whole video, but um, let's watch just about a minute and a half uh, from one of the tasks we developed to give you a, a flavor of what the videos uh, were like. For a long time, traveling to space was only done by a very small group of astronauts who had been trained in a space exploration program. But that has changed. In this video cast, we explore the world of commercial space travel. Will space be your next tourist destination? Let's hear what two science journalists have to say. Welcome, Ms. Anne Bax and Mr. Tom Walker. Can you imagine how exciting it must be to see the Earth from space? I mean, the views must simply be amazing. Yes, yes. And commercial space indeed means that it is no longer the privilege of those 500 or so astronauts who've been on a space exploration. Yes, it must be awesome to see. I'm dreaming away already, looking at the globe. But, but you know, it actually could also help the tourism mm -hmm. industry. As you can see in the graph, adventure tourism is currently the fastest growing trend of the tourism market. Space tourism really seems a logical next step in that trend, a stellar adventure. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not just about boosting the tourism industry. There are opportunities for science in this as well. Space research is really expensive. Okay, that just to give you a little idea of what the videos are like. And sort of um, just coincidentally in, in this bit of the video, um, the two experts uh, agreed quite a bit, but later in the video, there are um, issues on which they have contrasting views as well. Um, so after they had watched uh, the video twice and had been taking notes, if they wanted to, of course, um, then uh, it moved on to the writing stage. So again, because we uh, presented this on computers with our learners, um, we showed the instructions on the screen again, so to remind them what the writing should be like. Um, but if you work in a, a context with lower resources, um, this can also just be done on paper, right? 
um, just as the notes uh, are taken on paper as well. Um, so um, in this case, they had 20 minutes to compose their text, which should be coherent, summarize those key points uh, and so on. And so they um, got cracking with the writing then. Um, so, so that's one type of task we developed, uh, viewing to compare and contrast. Uh, a second task type we developed, uh, we've labeled viewing to describe tasks. And so in these kinds of tasks, as a test taker, you watch a video on how something is made, like the production process of something. Uh, and uh, that video provides you with an oral explanation of that production process. Uh, and at the same time, there's also visual illustration of that process. Uh, as well as uh, sometimes some words, phrases, or numbers are presented on the uh, in the video. Uh, so again, the video was played twice, and learners are allowed to take notes. And then the second step, they uh, have to write a short article that describes that production process. So we thought it might be quite nice actually for you to try this out. Um, we don't, we won't do the, the full tryout again, but just a, a snippet of it. So if you happen to have some uh, paper and a pen nearby, uh, please grab it uh, and, and have a go at trying to do uh, this task. Uh, if you don't uh, have paper or pen nearby, uh, don't worry. Uh, you can also try and just imagine in your head uh, how you would approach this task. Okay, so um, your instructions are as followed. You will watch a video describing how something is made. The video is normally played twice, but in this case for the webinar, we'll only play uh, an excerpt once, uh, but you are allowed to take notes while watching. Uh, then you need to write a short magazine article describing the different steps in the production process. And so if this was a proper task, your text uh, would need to be 150 to 200 words in length, uh, and it should be coherent. A title will be provided for you. OK, and so we will start the video. So uh, I hope that's all clear for everyone. Um, so be ready uh, and I'll start the video. As I say, it will show about a minute and a half, uh, but try to grasp um, some steps from the production process. Every day, millions of people around the world take a train to go to work, on a day out, or to visit family and friends. In the United Kingdom alone, more than 1,700 million train rides are made per year. So trains are big business. But do you know how trains are made? Let's have a look at how one compartment of a train, also called a carriage or a wagon, is made. It's a huge job. It all starts with an underframe. As you can see in the picture, the underframe can be found at the bottom of the carriage. It is a structure made of aluminium on which the rest of the carriage, the train floor, the wall panels and so on, are then built. To make the underframe, different pieces of aluminium need to be welded together. Under a very high temperature, the aluminium melts and the pieces are joined. When the aluminium cools down, we have one solid panel, the carriage's underframe. Next, something called bolsters, which are heavy parts that will connect the wheels to the train, are attached to the underframe. A fun fact is that this is done upside down because it's easier to fit these 600 kilogram bolsters resting above the underframe than to fight gravity. Once the bolsters are in place, the underframe is turned the right way around again, so that the wheels go underneath the underframe rather than on top of it. Okay, and we'll stop the excerpt here. I mean, the video does go on until a full carriage is made. Um, so now your task is to write at least the beginning of a short magazine article that describes the different steps in the production process. Uh, so 
have a go at it. And so your title is uh, How a Train Carriage is Made. Uh, and we'll give you um, a minute or two just to um, gather your thoughts on how you would start writing this and what you might pay attention to in your writing. Okay, um, so um, although obviously um, in a real test situation, you would have plenty more time, but hopefully you've in gained some idea of what a task like these, this is like. Um, now, we developed multiple versions of these tasks uh, because it was important to figure out that it's not it's possible to develop good quality tasks like these um, in sort of multiple times uh, and not, not just once. So we developed um, some further viewing to compare and contrast tasks. Uh, one was in which two experts discussed whether zoos should exist. And another example was uh, a discussion between two experts of whether people should uh, continue to use cars. Uh, for the viewing to ride tasks, uh, you saw a task on how a train carriage is made, but we also experimented with uh, a task on how contact lenses are made and one on how instant coffee is made. So as you can see, um, we've taken quite a sort of common, regular, um, in many contexts, everyday things and topics um, to develop these tasks, nothing out of the uh, ordinary. Uh, so we wonder at this point whether you might have some ideas or suggestions for other topics uh, that could be uh, used for developing tasks like these. And so perhaps let's start with some ideas on uh, viewing to describe tasks. So what other products or, or things could we potentially or could you uh, develop a task on uh, that describes the production process? Please uh, have a go and, and type in the chat. You've got any ideas? Book binding, fantastic. Yeah, cake and ice cream, how a dress is made, uh, chocolate bars, great ideas here, yeah. How to make sweets, mm -hmm. how to make a um, short animation film, how bricks are made, wonderful ideas, yes. So I think the essence is to take something that is quite accessible for your population at least, uh, and also something that is on the one hand quite common and known, but on the other hand, it's quite unlikely that people know by um, uh, sort of themselves how to do this, um, or at least your learners uh, know this by heart. Wonderful. So um, any ideas potentially on our other task types? So topics that two experts could be discussing. Uh, uh, do you have any suggestions on those? Climate change, mm -hmm. AI, uh, hybrid versus funky electric cars, wonderful ideas. Formula One, uh -huh. cars versus bicycles, how to maintain a good garden at home, I love that topic. <laughs> uh, should we eat meat, plenty of great ideas again mm -hmm. and of course the uh, key point is always to keep your particular population in mind as well what is suitable what is 
uh, accessible, what is acceptable in your uh, context uh, as well. Wonderful. Okay, I'll hand over now to uh, Judith, uh, who will share uh, some tips on how to create these kinds of tasks um, with limited resources. Right. Okay, so what are the tips for creating these tasks? And I'm sure you wonder how you can um, design similar tasks for your students. Um, first of all, uh, we must admit that we are not technology geeks. Um, we are just um, typical um, university lecturers with some technological skills. Um, and we are by no means experts uh, in the use of technology, but we created all these tasks ourselves with no additional support from anyone. We use commonly available soft and hardware uh, such as Word or PowerPoint. There, if you don't uh, have subscription to these um, products, there are lots of other free online uh, software that can be used for creating PowerPoint type presentations. We use the standard web camera, standard PCs and laptops. So nothing fancy, nothing particularly expensive for creating all these uh, videos and, um, and, and inserting all these pictures and, and designing the tasks. Um, all the materials that we have used for creating these assessment tasks were copyright free. Uh, we uh, searched uh, royalty free image stocks uh, websites such as Pixabay, Unsplash, Pexels, etc. that provide you with, uh, with images that you can um, use without infringing on copyright laws. We created Excel graphs, so the tourism graph that uh, Tineke showed, showed earlier was uh, created by us uh, using some, some figures, right? Um, in terms of content, and uh, we have already touched upon this when we asked you to um, suggest some topics for these assessment tasks, and Tineke already mentioned some of these criteria. So it is really important that the subject that these uh, assessment tasks cover should be accessible for your students, um, right? So for example, some of you suggested, you know, chemical reactions, which can be a great topic for, let's say, upper secondary school students in a more academically oriented school, but it might not work for younger children who know nothing about chemical reactions. And obviously, if your students are, for example, students of chemistry, they may not be, again, um, um, they might already have background knowledge about it. And you might might want to make sure that um, you, you present information that is still new to the students, that they wouldn't be able to write the, um, the, the essays or the, the summary uh, without watching the videos. The videos um, should also be rich in information points so that there is some content that the students can write about. And it should be um, a topic that can be represented visually. Um, so for example, straight space travel was a good topic because you could easily find images that describe space, the travel, and so on. And, and um, as any assessment task, it should be engaging and interesting for the target population. Otherwise, students don't engage and don't perform to the best of their abilities in these tasks, right? Um, for content inspiration, you can search for websites, YouTube videos, uh, media programs in, in various um, languages, not necessarily in English only. Um, maybe your country has some really good programs where you can borrow some uh, topics and ideas from. Um, our design process um, was um, to some extent complex, but also not very complicated. Um, we first developed uh, task instructions, um, then searched for topic ideas and information, uh, drafted the video script, identified the relevant pictures, animations, etc. Um, then we created voiceovers and slice, slice visualizations in, in PowerPoint. We exported these slides um, to make it a video in PowerPoint. Again, it's a very um, simple function in PowerPoint to export it as a video file. And then we uploaded it to a private um, YouTube channel so that the, the view um, of the video would be restricted and wouldn't be available to a, to a wider um, audience without our control. 
it was especially important for the research. If you want to make your, your videos um, accessible to a wider audience, then you might want to set it um, for public. Then we embedded the materials into the um, survey platform that we use for our research, which was uh, Qualtrics. Again, this is something, as Sineke mentioned, you can play the videos in class. Um, you don't necessarily want to embed it onto a digital platform, particularly if you have lower resources. Um, what was really important, uh, as mentioned before, and, and I'm going to talk about, about it um, later, is that we allow double play of the video um, so that students can uh, listen twice and absorb all the information. And there was no posing between the two plays. We allowed no taking as you also uh, practice here. And then we, um, we um, pre-piloted it with uh, some colleagues and then also with the target population just to make sure that uh, we um, the videos are understandable, interesting for the participants, for the students, and that they can complete the task meaningfully within the allotted time, right? And we asked also for, their, for the students' feedback. Now, um, when you develop an assessment task, um, it is important to write task specifications uh, for yourself, for your colleagues, for your team, or for higher stakes um, uh, assessment purposes. Uh, here we show you some uh, task specifications and in the materials that we have provided uh, already for you uh, under the links, you can see the detailed task specifications uh, for uh, our tasks. When you design task specifications before uh, um, uh, developing an assessment task, you always define what kind of skill you're going to focus on in terms of the general task features. You um, decide on the proficiency level based on your learners. You provide a description of the task and, and all the rest about instructions, the time that the students will spend on various aspects of the task, the delivery mode, the response format, the discourse that the students will need to provide, etc. So this is um, the first task feature description. And you also um, uh, specify the features of the input. For example, in our case, it's oral input as well as visual input and also the features of the expected response. So in our case, it was um, written text, right? Um, some more design tips if you want to uh, develop such uh, tasks yourself. Um, so it is uh, really important to consider the type of visuals that you will choose and then uh, how they will be included in the video. Otherwise, um, you might end up developing tasks that on the surface look like a multimodal task, but in fact, it will they will just require, require monomodal listening because the students will be just listening, not watching the video and maybe taking notes, not even you know, blinking up from their notes to the video. So in order to achieve that, actually students watch and listen at the same time and the, the input becomes multimodal, you need to embed content pictures that uh, illustrate uh, what the video describes. Um, you can also include words, phrases um, for that might be, for example, unfamiliar to the students, technical um, terms that you want to give uh, support with. Numbers, obviously you don't want to assess how well students can remember um, certain figures because the aim is language assessment. So you might provide numbers in a written format. You might have shapes, the moving animation, graphs and tables that the students uh, see. And you can also show the speakers when discuss the points, just as you have seen in the, in the example, because the body language, the facial expressions, the hand gestures, they all carry information and the students have to watch that so that they can infer how, for example, one speaker reacts to the points of the others, right? Um, the visuals should complement information from the listening text, again, just to guide the student's attention to the video itself. 
And it is, um, we have found that it is really important to include phrases in the listening text, such as, let's have a look at this figure. Look in the graph here, you can see. Now just look at how this, look at this picture, how beautiful the earth is from above, right? Otherwise the students and, and I have been collecting the data um, uh, myself and I did uh, some follow-up interviews with the students. Otherwise the students just um, look down at their paper and write if you don't provide these prompts, right? Um, these tasks are complex, right? As you have probably uh, seen so far, and we need to balance attention between the modes, but at the same time, keep memory demands low, right? We don't want to assess students' um, ability to re uh, remember information. We want to give them some new information that they can note down, um, but we want to assess how well they can integrate this information using the target language. Uh, and for this reason, we have decided to play the input twice, which I think is really important if you want to use assessment tasks like this and allow note taking during the viewing um, to relieve students from remembering the information um, just um, by heart. Um, we, you also need to give some purpose, as Tineke mentioned earlier, for viewing. And, um, and this purpose will regulate, again, students' attention and will enhance how they integrate information from the different modes. So there has to be an explicit direction for the viewing and making it clear what the target language function will be at the writing stage. Right. So tell us in the chat, what kinds of skills do you think these types of tasks might assess? So the task, types of tasks that you have seen and, and the multimodal tasks that you might uh, develop. Let's see. Uh, creativity, well, to some extent, although we might not want students to be very creative, we want them to use their language skills, all skills, listening skills. Um, comprehension, yet to some extent critical detail, listening for detail, um, understanding all the four skills, great communication skills, active listening, so analyzing. Um, so lots of great ideas. Thank you so much for sharing these. Some of you mentioned speaking. Yes, you can design integrated um, uh, listening and speaking tasks as well. Right, let me go back to my PowerPoint. Oops, okay, good. I don't know why it goes back. Uh, right, okay, good. So once you develop these tasks, you also need to rate them and develop a rating scale. We developed and again shared with you an analytic scale for each task type that looks at different aspects of the performance. And uh, the rating criteria had four aspects. Um, the first one viewing for writing. So to what extent students were able to uh, glean and summarize the information from the listening input and the viewing input. Um, organization and structure, how well students organize and structured their writing language use, which involved um, vocabulary as well as grammar and mechanics, so spelling uh, and punctuation. And you can see from the weighting that in our context, we gave um, lower weighting to mechanical aspects of writing. And we also provided the raters uh, with a crib sheet so that they can um, rate the viewing content. And we clarified what kind of information we are looking forward to be represented in the, um, in the writing. You can see our rating scale here. Um, for example, for the viewing to describe task, um, for the viewing for writing score, we um, to gain a score of four, then all relevant process steps selected from the video had to be um, fully accurately described and they had to be included in the accurate and, uh, sequence uh, of the way, in the way the process uh, was, uh, was described, right? Again, you can see this in more detail um, in our um, shared materials. The crib sheet included all the eight um, uh, content points uh, to support uh, the rating process. Um, if you want to see some examples of the uh, organization and structure rating scale, here again, to gain maximum points, students had to use fully effective signposting, 
including an excellent use of range of cohesive devices, etc. Right? For grammar, uh, we expected high level of accuracy, wide ranges, and high complexity. But we also specified that it has to be commensurate to the video input, right? So if your video uses more simple language, then you can't expect the students to represent the same input text in a more complex way, right? Um, so I think we have uh, given you ideas for uh, how you can create multimodal um, tasks and how you can uh, assess students' performance in these multimodal tasks. Uh, we'll give you a minute or so to reflect on what the main takeaway um, is from this uh, webinar, and you can share it with us in the, in the chat. And then we are very happy to take uh, questions from you. Yes, I can see a question about the rating scale. It's also already included among the materials, um, right? So any reflections, um, suggestions, ideas, how you're going to use it in the future perhaps, or um, maybe uh, you already have some tasks and you want to apply our rating scale only, All right? Let's... So while we're waiting, I'll just say thank you so much, Tineke and Judith. Um, that was really enlightening. I, I've read lots of comments saying this is great. This is inspiring. This is what we need. And uh, I think that's one of the takeaway. I, I like a comment from Asli. Asli says... Uh, the tasks seem very authentic and it's relevant to the needs of our students in this digital age. I think I think that's how I feel about things. And Zaina says it's more engaging and productive than a normal summative assessment. Yeah, I think lots of people will will agree. The word relevant is coming up a lot, actually. And I, I see that as one of the, the big the big takeaways. Um, yeah, so great. Um, we, we will kind of move on to, to questions because we've got quite a lot. <laughs> um, I will uh, go through some of the ones that were kind of asked at the start and then we'll move on to to what was left there later. Um, first of all, uh, I'll just say that um, both Tineke and Judith have mentioned that there's a link where you can get these tasks. So please check the chat, check the comments. And also um, that link is available on the handout. So in that link, you'll find everything you need, especially people are, are interested in the rating scales and, and Judith just told us they're, they're there. Um, great. So um, I've got a, a kind of fun question that came in and I wrote it down on my paper as well. It's from Cherry, Cherry Matthew. And Cherry asks, is one of the experts, Tineke, in the video? <laughs> <laughs> Very well spotted. So experts can be pretend experts, right? Um, so in yeah. our case, we uh, one of these so-called experts with me and the other one was just a car a colleague I grabbed in the corridor mm -hmm. here at work so the point mm -hmm. is you can develop these tasks just with your colleagues um yeah. or potentially even family members who knows who you <laughs> managed to do uh, so um, you can really do this low-key without a budget that was our approach as well yeah yeah, that's 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 a great tip that I kind of realized when I thought, yes, I think it was her. <laughs> that yeah, you don't need you don't need to spend um time looking for an expert. Uh you've got people all around you that can be the resource. And imagine if a, another teacher asks you, do you have five minutes to be in my video? Do you have two minutes to make a recording? So I mean, we wouldn't mind. So I don't think your colleagues would mind either. Yes, and um, also didn't use a recording studio or anything. Um, this was just my yeah. office. And the one tip I would give is that try to just have um, quite a, a blank wall behind you or something like that uh, that is not uh -huh. too distracting. Uh, but otherwise, uh, any space uh, around you. Uh, and yeah. and it's literally just a, a computer 
uh, with a built-in camera, a built-in microphone, um, so uh-huh. nothing out of the ordinary. Great. And I think even a mobile phone these days would yeah. maybe take some quite good footage. Absolutely. Yeah. So someone's written in the chat um, that actually that would be productive for students and it would be a health kind of produce a healthy relationship between colleagues to design the material together. I mean, there's a challenge for everyone watching. If you've watched this webinar and you've been inspired, you want to pass on some of this knowledge to colleagues, then get them involved. They can be the person that reads the script. They'll ask how you did it, what you're doing, and then you've you've passed on the knowledge. So there's a little um, uh, tip for everyone. A question from Valerie um, says, how long do you spend developing the audio script? Maybe that's a difficult question, but um, yeah, how about the ones that we saw? I, I think I have already answered <laughs> it in the chat. Oh, I have you? Okay. Day, but it took it took a few hours though a couple of reiterations to mm-hmm. develop these and we've been going back and forth and i think we have become more skillful developing some of these uh scripts as well um you you have to balance what you have to take into account when you develop these scripts is that it's spoken information right you will write down what you're going to say right but then it has to sound like spoken language and we had a few mm-hmm. corrections back and forth Forth because sometimes the text that I tended to write was quite dense in information and didn't necessarily have mm-hmm. the spoken features that we use. Um, mm-hmm. And then Tineke was really great picking up on those and, and inserting those, right? Repetitions, fillers, and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I see an acting career in your, in your future. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I know what you mean. I've recorded things on my mobile phone for class. And the first time that I record it, it doesn't sound very natural. So those fillers and recording again until it feels like your own words. Um, yeah, must must help. And I'd also like to say that, I mean, one of the reasons that it took us a bit longer is that we really started from scratch, um, trying to imagine what could this be like. Whereas mm. by um, after the first task, then we were able to develop those task specifications. And in a way, then we had a template for what it should be like. And so that mm-hmm. made it much easier once we had made all those decisions. So uh, for other people, um, as, as we've said, we've shared all our materials or task specifications or tips are freely available on that uh, web link. Um, please feel free to use that and start work from that if you want to develop your own. Uh, and of course, you're also welcome just to to use the tasks we've already developed in your context, if they are suitable for learners, of course. Yeah, thank you for being so generous and, and providing those. That's that's fantastic. We we actually have a question about using them um, from Astrid, who teaches lower level students. Um, so kind of A1, A2 learners, these tasks might not be available, but are multimodal assessments possible and suitable for for those of elementary stage learners? This can go to either of you. <laughs> yes, um, I mean, obviously, the tasks we developed were aimed at a higher level. Um, so those exact tasks, no, but it is definitely possible to lower the language level, lower the complexity, again, depending also on the age group you're working with. Um, mm-hmm. Some there were a couple in our uh, uh, in our context that were sort of A two, some B one, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we know that uh, of course they performed less well, but uh, the task itself was not a, an issue for them. Um, so if your target group mm-hmm. is at a lower mm-hmm. level, you can definitely adapt the complexity of the language as such. Uh, of the ideas and so on. Um, I guess A1 might be more tricky, but mm-hmm. from an A2 level onwards, um, I, I believe it is possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can. Would maybe, you know, with, with smaller children, A1 level, multimodal story um, telling and retelling, perhaps not necessarily writing. Yeah but presenting stories using using visual illustrations, presenting, you know, very simple processes, how something is made is still possible, right? 
And then you can provide language support. So that's the other thing. You know, you can have glossaries, mm -hmm. you can have definitions, et cetera, right? Yeah, true, true. I mean, I think, and it's like any t type of listening text you want to bring into the class, you've got to think about level, age, interests. Um, and thank you for all the people watching. Um, all the teachers have given so many cool ideas uh, about what the topics could be. Um, there were lots of really great things that I wrote down. I especially liked uh, how to bake a cake. <laughs> that was good. And discussing hybrid cars and electric cars, things that are if interesting for the students in the class. I mean, it was it's clear that and so many topics can um, can work here. Um, Asley has asked us, uh, have you used this with learners and how did they respond? Can you tell us a bit about what they thought? Because probably new for quite a lot of learners. Yes. Um, so, yes, we have uh, used this with learners. Uh, so we um, actually conducted research on it. And so we had in the end a group of 134 learners in different schools in a European country mm -hmm. who completed the tasks. Um, and so we we also uh, rated their performances. And as Judith said, she uh, with a, a group of 20 of those, she actually did interviews afterwards. Uh, in mm -hmm. which they saw the tasks and their notes again, and then they talked, uh, you did through uh, how they had done it, what they had um, captured from the tasks and so on. Uh, and in addition, uh, with the group, we also administered a, a quick uh, perception questionnaire to gather their uh, opinions on it. Um, and uh, fortunately for us, and, and great for multimodal assessments, <laughs> is that... Um, the the tasks really worked well. Uh, they showed to um, yeah uh, give us the the kind of evaluations uh, we would have expected and we needed, uh, uh -huh. and, and they had very positive views on it. Uh, it was really interesting to hear also and. Uh, a lot of them commented on how they really got engaged into the topics of these tasks like and they would say mm -hmm. things like, I really didn't know that I learned something there and so as whereas it was an assessment uh, they felt very engaged and, and interested and so that was really great to see. Uh, I don't know, you, just, you want to... Uh, yeah, I mean, I was there at almost every data collection session and the students oh, wow. were raising, wow, this is something new, this is unusual. <laughs> I wish language tests adapted these types of tasks. These are so much more engaging and interesting. So, so I mean, I we we collected data from over 130 students in, and really positive feelings. Also, you could observe them, not just, you know, reported in writing, but, but I observed the students' faces and emotional reactions and they really enjoyed yeah. us yeah oh what a great experience to be there in the class um watching uh, and talking to people that I mean that that kind of says it all that people are interested and it's something that's become part of people's normal lives like lots of my students learn things through watching YouTube videos and how-to videos and yeah I see that I kind of see the future with so many more of these are you optimistic in where language testing is going is it is it going in this direction or is this a a kind of lone project i hope not <laughs> uh yeah i think we we definitely obviously also hope not but, <laughs> i think it's also not a question of um Will it go there? In a way, it has to go there because yeah. the aim of language testing is that we assess uh, language for the real world, right? In in most contexts, mm -hmm. I mean, there's only a couple of exceptions where we wouldn't want to do that. Uh, but uh, essentially, in our language assessments, we need to reflect um, real life language uses. And mm -hmm. this is a reality multimodal language use. So um, yeah, it's we would expect it to go in this direction, but it also is necessary that we go in this direction. 
Yeah. And yeah. then just to add, you know, there was a question about students with disabilities and it ties to kind of my oh. area of expertise. And, and some of this yeah. multimodal input, for example, makes uh, information um, and makes the input more accessible for students who might have disabilities, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it's the two sources of information support each other. And, and so that there is also an accessibility and fairness um, issue that hopefully will be taken up by larger scale assessment um, so that you know, they move towards multimodal assessment tasks as well. Wow, that's very, very true. And I, I hadn't even really thought of that. And I think it's a, another full webinar to actually talk about how that would be uh, beneficial um, for students with special educational needs. All right, there's something else to investigate, everyone. Um, we're nearly out of time, so I just want to say thank you again to Tineke and, and Judith from joining us from the UK, from, from Lancaster University. There will be links to um, handout in the chat and you'll be able to, to get their materials and, and take a look at what you could use and what you could design. If you design something, come and tell us in the comments in Facebook what you've designed. We would we would love to know. So thank you all also to uh, Joe, who's working behind the scenes answering people's questions here in Zoom. Um, and thanks to our, our Facebook team who are uh, working on the comments there. So that is we am working with us today. We'll be back soon with Chiara Brusano to talk more about um, listening skills. Um, but she's talking about what technology we can use to kind of enhance listening skills. So don't go away. Join us again in 15 minutes. So everyone, thank you so much for today. Have a lovely day. Goodbye. Thank you. And a big thank you from Judith and me as well for joining us today. Uh, and shall I perhaps share our last screen uh, slide with uh, the link? Perfect. Right. Yeah, that would be great. Thank so you. So everyone, Tommy. here's the link again. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, so that's the tasks, the specs, the scales, everything that you saw today, they are they're oh. freely uh, available on the screen that you're going to see just now. Okay, everyone. All right. We'll see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>